UFC 301 betting and DraftKings show. We have 14 fights this Saturday. I'm John Kelly. Let's hear the picks. And we're going to get things started in the flyweight division as Alessandro Costa is currently a minus 130 favorite. The comeback on Kevin Borchas is plus 110. And this is actually my first bet of the card. I backed Borchas on the money line at plus 131 because I think that Borchas is going to be very competitive in this fight. And I actually think he could have a couple advantages as well. But we'll start on the Costa side. You know, we've seen more of Costa at the UFC level. Both of these guys formerly fought on Dana White's Contender Series, which is kind of like the theme of this pay-per-view card. A lot of former Contender Series fighters, and these are two of them. Now, Costa wasn't super impressive when he fought on Contender Series. A lot of people actually thought it was a robbery against Andres Luna. I actually have been kind of underwhelmed by Costa. I was kind of expecting him not to be this like stud prospect, but I actually thought he was one of the better fighters on that season. And we just really haven't seen it because despite him looking okay at times, you know, he won a first round off Amir Albazi on two of the three judges scorecards. He's got power in his hands, sharp leg kicks as well, has shown he can grapple a little bit too. But I, I think there's a lot of holes in, in multiple parts of his game. For starters, the grappling is super sloppy. And he doesn't even usually go to it until he gets stung on the feet. And he has been rocked multiple times. He's been finished as well. I don't trust the volume because he's generally not putting a ton of activity out there. I don't trust the cardio. And I don't trust the durability. So those are some concerns especially in the 125 weight class. And if I don't expect him to aggressively grapple here, well, then I have to like the Borchos side because Borchos is one-dimensional in the sense that he wants to keep it on the feet. He needs to keep it on the feet. But while it's on the feet, he's, he's got great striking, comes from a high-level karate style striking background, and he likes to push a pace. Sometimes he's not able to keep that pace up for 15 minutes. He's only fought to decision a couple times in his career. But... I also think he's going to be having the better gas tank than Costa. I think he's going to put more volume out there than Costa does. And I just don't think that Costa's grappling is going to be this huge edge that I think a lot of others are kind of expecting here because Borchash has shown, yes, he can give up takedowns, but he's constantly trying to work back to his feet, not accepting the position. And I think either of these guys are capable of hurting each other on the feet. I'm going to side with the slight underdog here who I think is going to be more reliable to put up volume. And I think he's the more durable fighter as well. So we're going Kevin Borchos by TKO. That's the official pick. Next fight up, we have Ismael Bonfim, a minus 460 favorite. The comeback on Vince Pichel is plus 360. And we'll start on the Bonfim side. He's taken about a year off since he lost that fight against Benoit Saint-Denis as a sizable favorite. Got submitted and finished in that fight. And now he's coming in as one of the biggest betting favorites on the card. And it makes sense because even though I don't think Bomfim is like this superstar prospect by any stretch, I still think he's going to have multiple advantages over Vince Bichel here, who's coming off a two-year layoff and turns 42 years old later this year. You guys know I generally don't like to back the old fighters, even though I've kind of broken that rule recently with the Gabriel Benitez bet last week. But Vince Bichel at, at almost 42 years old, coming off a long layoff, going up against somebody that I think is going to be way faster than him, a better striker as well. Like, I just don't think he's going to be able to mix in the wrestling here. I think Bonfim kind of stuffs all his takedowns and really just styles on him on the feet on his way to getting a finish. So we're, I'm going to side with Bonfim. Bonfim by TKO. That's the official pick. Next fight up, this one's in the women's flyweight division as Dione Barbosa is a minus 205 favorite. The comeback on Ernesta Karaskate is plus 175. And we'll start on the Barbosa side. You know, she's fighting in front of her home Brazilian crowd. She actually fought on this past Last season of contender series as well and she won that fight by first round submission and she took that fight on just six days notice so it was very impressive performance there even though the level of competition wasn't that great but I do think she has a pretty solid skill set that will translate to the UFC level for starters she comes from an, an Olympic judo background she also holds a black belt in Brazilian jiu-jitsu and that's typically how she wins most of her fights is she uses that judo to get it to the ground and then once it's there she's hunting for submissions where she's been pretty good at finding those as well now the Karaskate side she also fought on contender series she fought Carly Judas who was actually an impressive 
although green, an impressive young striking prospect. And Karis Kate just walked her down and went to war. It was very impressive, super fun fight, even though she wasn't the most technically sound. She ate a ton of punches in that fight. I, I believe they set the record for like most uh, significant strikes landed in contender series history for that division. And it was really just because Karis Kate just literally walked her down the entire time, ate a bunch of shots, but landed a bunch of her own as well. She comes from a Lithuanian kickboxing background, just a 5-0 and professional record with one draw in there. But I worry about the level of competition and her defensive grappling, particularly because we haven't really seen it tested, at least not at this level. And I think Barbosa is going to test her in those areas. And that's where I think the biggest advantage is in this fight. I expect Barbosa to get the fight to the ground. And when she does, I'm not convinced that Karaskate is going to be able to escape those positions. So I'm going Barbosa by submission. That's the official pick. Next up, we have another contender series fighter from this past season. It's Mauricio Huffy, who came in as a decent sized underdog and cast for people in that contender series fight and the stylistic matchup was actually kind of similar to this one against Jamie Malarkey because Malarkey is a guy that wants to try to push a pace on the feet and mix in the wrestling he averages around two and a half takedowns per 15 minutes and that's probably what he's going to try to do here but I just don't trust him to have success in that area. And he's just always so willing to engage in these brawl style of fights where he's the one that ends up on the the worst end of it because he's been knocked out five times in his career. The durability is completely untrustworthy and he's facing somebody who wins most of his fights by landing big power shots. Most of Huffy's wins have come by knockout. So I'm going to side with the younger fighter who I think is way more powerful on the feet and way more trustworthy in terms of the durability. Even though I have questions with Huffy's defensive grappling and cardio down the stretch, I just don't think it matters against Malarkey here because I think he hurts him at a high clip. We're going Huffy by knockout. That's the official pick. Next fight up, we have Drakkar Close, a minus 180 favorite. The comeback on Joaquim Silva is plus 150. And we'll start on the close side. He's coming off a first round knockout slam over Joe Selecki. He's currently on a three fight win streak as well. And I do think he's the rightful favorite in this matchup because Close is just a very well-rounded, just solid fighter wherever the fight goes. He generally keeps a pretty solid pace on the feet. He's got power as well, and he can mix in the wrestling. He averages around 1.75 takedowns per 15 minutes. So he's just a guy that's very good wherever the fight goes. And I think the other things that are going to favor him here is the intangibles, because I expect him to have the better gas tank down the stretch and I think he's much, much more durable as well. And that's the main thing on the Silva side, because while Silva has power himself, he's got that knockout upside. We know he has a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as well, even though he doesn't really pursue the grappling all that often. But the biggest issue for me is that durability, because he's been knocked out three times in his career. We know the cardio generally starts to fade after that first seven and a half minutes or so. So this is one I feel pretty comfortable on the Drakkar close side. And I think he has the potential to hurt Silva as well if he really starts to gas pedal him and get him out of there. We're going close by TKO. That's the official pick. Next up, we have Gene Silva, a small favorite now, minus 125. The comeback on William Gomez is plus 105. And we'll start on the Silva side. This is a guy who is definitely a character. He's another contender series fighter from this past season. And you guys probably remember him because he had a very slow walkout during his UFC debut. And then once he won, he started barking like a dog. It was absolutely absurd. So um, yeah, that's Gene Silva for you. He's not the highest fight IQ guy, but he's got big power and he's very aggressive. Where I think he could struggle at the UFC level is against people who are durable enough to take his big shots and drag him into deeper waters because I don't think his cardio is very good. I don't think his defensive grappling is very good either. And on the Gomi side, like, I, honestly, I can't stand William Gomez just because his fighting style is so boring to me. The fact that he's 3-0 and in the UFC is... Like, it blows my mind. I think sooner or later, somebody's going to catch this dude. But despite my unenthusiasm towards Gomez, I respect the fact that he is a high fight IQ 
fighter and he knows what it takes to win rounds at the UFC level he's going to have a huge size advantage here and the way that he fights and we are in the bigger cage here he likes to keep that distance he likes to use his length with those kicks to keep his opponents at bay and he might be able to do that here against Silva so if Silva struggles to get inside and hurt Gomes I think it could get kind of dicey down the stretch here, especially because I think Gomes just manages his gas tank better. And I think he has the potential to mix in a couple of takedowns as well. We've seen him do that in previous fights. So this is one where, as much as it pains me to say, I think Gomes is a very live underdog. I'm actually going to pick him to win this fight, Gomes by decision. But in terms of DraftKings, he just doesn't really have the type of upside that we're looking for. I think basically all of the upside is on the Silva side, but he just needs to hurt him early. Because if he doesn't do that, I think he has the potential to lose this one on the judges' scorecards. So we're going Gomes by decision. That's the official pick. Next fight up, we have Mick DeBeck Aralbay, a minus 265 favorite. The comeback on Elvis Brenner is plus 215. And we'll start on the Aralbay side. He's coming off his UFC debut against Euros Medic, where he looked really good in that fight. And we expected some pretty solid things coming into the UFC. And he proved that in his debut, submitted Euros Medic, who we just saw with a big first round knockout victory over Tim Means last week. He's just another one of those guys that's really solid wherever the fight goes. His striking's not going to blow you away, but it's serviceable enough. And he's got a well-rounded ground game. We saw that in the debut. And I think that's going to be his path to victory here against Elvis Brenner, who is not the biggest round winner. He's not the most technical guy, but what he has is he's got that dog in him because every Elvis Brenner fight, you just know that he's not going to quit and he's going to go out there and fight for your money. And you hate to bet against those guys, especially once they have a big plus money price tag in front of them. But I do think that Aralbay is just the more proven, more well-rounded skill set here. And I think he could land takedowns and really consolidate position because Brenner, while he does have some aggressive grappling, 11 career submission victories, I think he is liable to give up the takedowns and play off his back a little too long. And I think Aralbay is good enough to avoid any of those type of submissions and I think he's the better round winner here. So I'm going with the raw buy. I think it goes the full 15 minutes here. We're going to raw buy by decision. That's the official pick. Next fight up, we have Jasmine Lucindo, a minus 410 favorite. The comeback on Carolina Cavalcavage is plus 320. And this is one where I, I could see it playing out a little bit more competitive than the betting odds suggest, but I still expect Lucindo to be the one that's clearly winning the rounds here because I, she's just one of the more exciting prospects in the division. She's still young, still improving, and she's got a pretty well-rounded skill set. On the feet, she's very fast, got some powerful kicks as well, and she's shown she can mix in some takedowns as well. And Carolina, despite being on a nice little win streak here, at this stage in her career, you know, she's almost 39 years old. I just think she's going to be at a clear physicality and athleticism disadvantage here. I think the speed is going to be key on the Lucindo side. And I kind of just think Lucindo beats her wherever the fight goes. But in terms of DraftKings, I just don't really love the price tag for Lucindo. You know, you have a lot of solid spend up options this week on such a big slate. And in a fight that I expect to be somewhat competitive and to go the full 15 minutes I just don't think she has that type of ceiling that you want on such a big slate like this so we're going to side with Lucindo Lucindo by decision but in terms of DraftKings I just think there's better fights to target up and down this slate next up we have a fun matchup between Joe Anderson Brito and Jack Shore currently Brito is a minus 170 favorite with Jack Shore on the comeback at plus 142 and we'll start on the Brito side he's coming off that comeback submission victory against Jonathan Pierce where he he was clearly losing that fight and ended up submitting him in the second round there. So pretty impressive stuff there against somebody that pushes a heavy grappling pace like Jonathan Pierce does. Now, Brito is very explosive. He's very powerful on the feet. He's certainly got the capability to hurt you, but he's also capable of mixing in the takedowns, consolidating position, controlling his opponents on the mat. We've seen that multiple times from him as well. Now, the Jack Shore side, he's coming off actually a hand injury where he had surgery this past fall, and he's only actually been training for the past three months or so for this fight. But in general, Jack Shore is a very solid fighter as well. You know, he doesn't have the most impressive striking, but he's got a solid jab and he'll look to use that repeatedly until he closes distance and tries to grind on you. He typically pushes a heavy grappling pace himself. He averages around three and a half 
takedowns per 15 minutes. But I just think he's going to struggle here if he tries to grapple Brito because Brito's one of those guys that's smaller and very compact. He's just a powerhouse. Those guys are usually hard to take down. And I know Brito has given up takedowns, but he's also got some pretty powerful tools that I think somebody who gets sloppy when they're pursuing the grappling like Jack Shore does, I think he can make Jack Shore pay here and potentially hurt him. So I'm going to side with the Brito side in front of his home crowd in Brazil. I think he gets it done. We're going Joe Anderson, Brito by knockout. That's the official pick. And kicking off the pay-per-view main card, we have Kai Bohio, a minus 550 favorite now the comeback on Paul Craig is plus 410 and we'll start on the Kai Bohio side another former contender series fighter another fighting nerds fighter along with Gene Silva who are both fighting on this card so he's going to have the hometown crowd in front of him so maybe that'll light some type of fire under him to be more aggressive and pursue the finish because that's really been the one negative thing about him is he's just too, you know, he plays it safe too often. A lot of these fights where he's just back backpacking guys and not really being aggressive in terms of trying to finish the fight. And that's really the only knock on him because aside from that, he's a very well-rounded fighter, very smart high IQ fighter, doesn't take a lot of risk on the feet. He's got some powerful leg kicks, some solid striking, but he's at his best when he goes to the grappling. He holds a black belt in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and he's one of the better back takers in the division. But at times, he's been almost back take reliant, which is a little bit concerning, especially when you're dealing with somebody like a Paul Craig, who's one of the most dangerous grapplers on the UFC roster. Now, Craig fighting at 185, he's only had two fights down here, But he's looked okay. You know, the weight cut really hasn't affected him too much. And I just expect him to be very competitive in the grappling exchanges. So I wonder if Bohio, being that he's a high fight IQ fighter, he knows he's going to have a striking advantage. Maybe he just chooses to keep this one on the feet. Either way, I think he gets it done. I just worry that the betting line is getting kind of crazy now at minus 550. But I do think he gets his hand raised. I'm going to say Kai Bohio by decision just because I've watched enough of him to know that he almost never aggressively pursues a finish. But a knockout win over Paul Craig wouldn't be the most surprising thing either. I'm going to side with Bohio. I think he gets his hand raised. We're going Bohio by decision. That's the official pick. Which brings us to our next matchup as Michelle Pereira is coming in as a minus 540 favorite. The comeback on Ihor Patira is plus 400. And we'll start on the Pereira side. You know, he's a showman. He he wants to put on a show every time he's out. You better believe in front of his Brazilian crowd, he's going to do something stupid. He's going to do something crazy. You know, dancing on the walkout, backflips into guard, flying knockouts, jumping off the cage. He's going to try something wild here. And the thing is, is Patira is a bad enough opponent that he might actually be able to pull it off against Patira because... I think he's just going to have multiple advantages here. He's too fast, he's too powerful, and the grappling difference is absolutely massive here because Patira, while he does have some okay boxing and a little bit of power himself, and a little bit of power himself, his cardio is usually not that great, and his defensive grappling is never great. And that's where I think Pereira has the biggest advantages here. So even if he tries some crazy stuff on the feet that doesn't really work out, he's got the grappling to fall back on. And I think that's the difference here. We're going Michelle Pereira by TKO. That's the official pick. And next matchup, we have another minus 500 fighter and another former contender series fighter as Vitor Petrino is a minus 500 favorite with Anthony Smith on the comeback at plus 390 and credit to Anthony Smith here you know he's coming off that second round knockout victory over Ryan Spann last week hops on a plane flies to Brazil and now he's fighting again Um, So he's facing Vitor Petrino here. Petrino, I just think he's got too much horsepower for him because even though Petrino has some holes himself, he's low volume on the feet. He can be hit. His defense is not great. He's got big power when he lands, so he makes it count when he lands. And we know he can push a heavy wrestling pace. You know, he's really relied on his wrestling in certain matchups. And I think this could be one here where he's got the potential to hurt Smith on the feet 
or just take him down because we know Smith, despite being a black belt, he can give up takedowns. He can give up control time. So I'm going to side with the younger guy here who I just think has more tools at this stage in his career. We're going Petrino by TKO. That's the official pick. Which brings us to the co-main event as Jonathan Martinez is a minus 162 favorite. The comeback on Jose Aldo is plus 136. And we'll start on the Martinez side. He's currently on a six-fight win streak. And he's a guy who is very one-dimensional in the sense that he's very leg kick reliant, but he's exceptional with those leg kicks. And that's why he's so difficult to deal with because a lot of people just can't deal with the leg kicking attack that he brings. But I still have some concerns with him, particularly in this matchup, because whenever Martinez isn't able to have as much success kicking the legs, he doesn't really have anything to fall back on. He doesn't really look to grapple and his durability is not that great either. He's actually been knocked down four times in the UFC. The Davy Grant one comes to mind because Davy Grant actually knocked him out completely. So his durability is not that great. You just have to be able to deal with the leg kicks. Now, what does Jose Aldo do historically? Checks leg kicks very well. You look back at the Pedro Munoz fight, one of the better leg kickers in the division. He checked almost every single one of them, did not deter him one bit. Up and down his career, he's always been very good at dealing with the leg kicks. And I just think if he's able to really defend those kicks from Martinez. Martinez is going to be like, oh snap, like what do I do now? That type of, like I expect Aldo to be able to give him a vet lesson here. He's the better boxer. He's more experienced. And I actually think he's more durable as well, even at this stage in his career. 38 years old. Now he is coming off a two-year layoff and that's the concern. But that's also why the line is where it is. Because if he wasn't 38 years old and coming off a long layoff, this line would probably be flipped to be honest with you. And I think if this fight is even somewhat competitive, like you're not coming into Brazil and winning a close decision against the King of Rio in Brazil. Like it's just not happening. So I'm back in the veteran here. It's time for a vet lesson. We're going Jose Aldo by decision. That's the official pick. Which brings us to our main event as Alexandra Pantoja is a minus 185 favorite. The comeback on Steve Ersig is plus 154. And this one was kind of surprising when they threw it together. It was one of those where I kind of had to do a double take because I'm like, wait, Ersig's getting a title shot already? Um, he's just 3-0 and in the UFC, but he's a pretty solid fighter. I'm not going to say he doesn't deserve it. It just seems like it came really fast for him. But I do think it's a pretty tall task for him to walk into Brazil in enemy territory and snatch the belt from Alexander Pantoja, who's a very skilled fighter. You know, I talk about Pantoja in all of his fights the same way because his fighting style really hasn't changed. He's very aggressive early from the opening bell. He tries to big brother you, walk you down, force you into those grappling exchanges and really just manhandle you until he forces his way to the back and potentially gets you out of there by submission. Now he's very good at finding the back, but if he's unable to get that submission, where I worry about Pantoja, and I say this every time, is that cardio really starts to fall off a cliff. Now, it's not like he's incapable of winning fights. We saw that against Brandon Roy Val, even though the cardio did get bad down the stretch and Roy Val started to come on late, he was still able to win the fight. So it's not like he can't fight, but it is a factor, especially when you're facing somebody like a Steve Ersig, who historically pretty durable, pretty good cardio, pretty well-rounded. Like, I think this is one where Ersig is going to be competitive, but I think he has to extend the fight out because early on, I favor Pantoja. Even though he's hittable on the feet, I don't think Ersig has the type of power to make him pay. And I think Pantoja is, is going to be the better submission grappler, at least while they're fresh. So I think Ersig probably has to extend this one to have a chance, but... Either way, I still think even in an extended fight, Pantoja's just probably banking enough of the early rounds to where he just kind of has to hang on, similar to that Roy Val dynamic. So I'm going to side with Pantoja. Pantoja by decision. That's the official pick. And as always, guys, check out fightnumbers.com for my DraftKings player rankings, my ownership projections as well. We have prize picks plays, underdog fantasy plays. Of course, we have the odd screen that updates in real time for live betting during the events. We got picks by Ozzy, Pepe, and Evan. Ton of other stuff on there. Definitely check it out. And this week only, use promo code 301 for 25% off your first payment fightnumbers.com. I'll link it in the comments as well. Best of luck, and we'll see you guys next time.